Thank you very much for coming, and we would like to start this program today. Um, I would like to start this program today by inviting up our Associate Provost for Academic Affairs, Dr. Sandra Hill. Yes, we certainly do welcome all of you. I know it's a busy time of the semester and we've all got work to do, but you're going to get enlightened and the work that you're doing now is going to be facilitated by the learning you're going to get today. So this is wonderful to see all your faces out there. I don't think we could have brought a more timely speaker in uh, for a topic such as the legal issues around the legalization, um, the social justice issues, sorry, around the legalization of marijuana. Um, we have so many things going on in our current administration, um, a, a border wall uh, idea to keep out the drugs, um, also uh, issues, justice issues surrounding sending uh, 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 our military National Guard uh, down to uh, guard our border to keep the drugs out. Uh, so there's plenty of justice issues going on now um, uh, around this topic, and certainly the social justice issues that follow along with that. Uh, we have folks incarcerated for possession of marijuana. What happens with them should marijuana be legalized? So many, many issues uh, surrounding justice, social justice, and many sociological issues that I'm excited to hear about. So I'm going to leave the stage and let Dr. Kearney introduce our guest speaker. And again, welcome and thanks for coming out. Hey, thank you, Dr. Hill. So uh, again, welcome. My name is uh, Richard Kearney. I'm uh, currently serving this year as the director of the Gandhian Forum for Peace and Justice. Uh, for those of you who are uh, not familiar with this organization, it's a campus-based organization, and it's been around for uh, quite a few years now. And what the forum seeks to do is to promote dialogue and education on some of the greatest challenges that confront us in the 21st century resolving conflicts, eliminating war, and advancing the cause of social justice. And part of our mission includes uh, introducing and engaging students and teachers on issues of peace, nonviolence, and justice. So among the things we do is we uh, sponsor programs like this uh, every semester. And uh, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of the uh, co-sponsors of this program today. So that includes the Office of the Provost, the Katsakis College of Business, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, the Department of English, the Department of Political Science, the Department of Public Health, the Department of Sociology, the Asian Studies Program, the uh, Criminology and Criminal Justice Program, and the Legal Studies Program, all of whom uh, were co-sponsors for this event today, so we, we thank them. So as you're probably aware, there's a chance, and perhaps a very good one, that New Jersey will soon join several other states where, um, among other things, recreational use of marijuana has been legalized or decriminalized. Our current governor is on the record as being favorable to such a change in state law, and the public uh, also appears to be favorable to it. So according to a new poll of New Jersey residents that was conducted recently and reported on by the uh, Stockton Polling Institute of the William J. Hughes Center for Public Policy, 49% of respondents in New Jersey backed legalizing uh, recreational marijuana, while 44% opposed such a move. 5% of respondents were unsure. <clears throat> there are, as you are probably aware, a number of constituencies of interest around the issue of marijuana legalization, to name just two. There are those who have uh, advocated the use of marijuana for medical purposes, and they're strongly in favor of a policy that would make such uh, applications easier um, than they are right now. And the business community um, also sees uh, great opportunities. Just uh, last month, there was a, a program uh, organized by the Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey on this very topic. Uh, I wasn't aware uh, until recently uh, that there is a, a New Jersey Cannabis Industry Association. But there are other serious questions uh, that need attention. Uh, for one thing, we have the entire history of drug policy as it pertains to marijuana up to this point, the arrests and convictions for possession and sale, and this is part of a broader context of drug policy that has centered primarily around a law enforcement approach and one that's been quite discriminatory in its effects. So will the legalization of marijuana address this legacy of criminal records? 
Um, will this move simply exempt one particular substance from the general framework of law enforcement um, centered drug policy while leaving the framework itself largely intact? Or could the debate over marijuana legalization be an opportunity to perhaps question and challenge our current approach to drug policy in general? So to help us understand some possible ways that we might look at this issue from a social justice standpoint, um, we have um, invited our speaker. So uh, Tess Borden is a staff attorney at the American Civil Liberties Union of New Jersey, where she works on a range of civil rights and civil liberties issues. Prior to joining the uh, ACLU in New Jersey, Tess was the uh, Arya Nair Fellow at the National ACLU and Human Rights Watch organization. She's author of um, this report, which is titled Every 25 Seconds, The Human Toll of Criminalizing Drug Use in the United States. This, um, this is a very nice printed version, but it, the report itself is also available for download uh, from the Human Rights Watch site. Tess has also worked for the United Nations Special Rapporteur on extrajudicial summary or arbitrary executions, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in the Hague, Netherlands, and Human Rights Watch's uh, West Africa Division in Dakar, Senegal, as well as spending time before law school as an immigration paralegal. Um, so I invite you uh, to join me in welcoming our speaker. Uh, please welcome Tess Borden. Thank you so much, all. Um, I'm really delighted and honored to be here. Um, and thank you for the really lovely introductions. I apologize. I didn't realize you were all going to be at the podium um, because it's covered in these loud sound making buttons. Um, so for those of you who can stay and are ACLU supporters, I have lots of buttons about voting and um, non-discrimination and the Muslim ban and women's rights somewhere and dreamers and people, not prisons. Um, so I have a whole goodie bag up here, which I'll come to at various points. Um, but I want to sort of, can you all hear me this way too? I want to ground us, I think, in some of the initial questions that Dr. Kearney and Dr. Hill asked um, or suggested. Um, and those are twofold. I think first, we're standing and sitting here in New Jersey. And New Jersey is um, at a really exciting precipice, I think, where we're about to leap into what legalization looks like. Um, our governor committed in his campaigning um, to making legalization a priority um, and also to having racial justice be a part of that. Um, at first, it was supposed to be in the first 100 days. Um, it's not going to be the first 100, obviously. Um, but I, I feel really confident that it will be in this calendar year. And so I think the broader challenge that we as advocates um, and social justice warriors are grappling with right now is how to make sure that bill that ends up on his desk um, is one that is committed to racial and social justice. Um, and I think as we do that here in New Jersey, we're obviously not the first state to think about legalization. Um, but I think we are one of the first, only um, beaten by Vermont, to do it through the legislature. Um, which means we can do more. Um, and I think we are the first that's talked about retail in a meaningful way and social justice and what that entails. Um, and so I want to talk about that. And, and I sort of submit to you that New Jersey is in a space to be a real leader, um, not just in the region, but in the country. And the second thing I want to talk, to about, talk about is what Dr. Kearney raised is, you know, so what? Is this just about pot, which is important, um, and the way marijuana laws are enforced, which are discriminatory? Um, or does it also sort of tell us something broader about the way we think about drug policy, the way arguably we even think about criminal justice, um, the way we think about ourselves? So I want to spend a little time talking about that too. Um, but first, because I really hate talking at people, I want to get to know you a little bit. Um, so as you've heard, I'm a lawyer. Um, and lawyers sometimes are boring, um, and lawyers sometimes lecture. Um, but first and foremost, I'm a person. Um, so I'm going to try to talk to you from that space this afternoon. Um, and with that in mind, can I just make you stretch a little bit? Can, can I have a show of hands for students in the room? Nice. OK. Um, and graduate students? <laughs> um, and freshmen? Nice. Welcome. Um, freshman year is really fun. Have fun. Uh, sophomores? Juniors? 
good amount of juniors, seniors. Nice, welcome. Um, enjoy it. The real world is scary. <laughs> um, and what about people who consider yourself um, in support of legalization, marijuana legalization? Um, and those who are on the fence? Okay, looking at you. <laughs> um, and those who are opposed? Cool. I'd really love to hear from you, those of you who are on the fence and opposed also. Um, and um, unlike every other space that I ever speak in as a lawyer, there is no right or wrong answer in this room. Um, and what about those of you who want to go on to do sort of public interest or social justice work? Cool, nice, well welcome. Um, I didn't have a Gandhian forum when I went to school, but it seems like a really wonderful um, platform and opportunity for discussion. Um, and so I encourage you to keep using that as students here at William Patterson. Um, so as you heard, I am a litigator now, um, but I spent a whole year from 2015 to 2016 not wearing my lawyer cap, but instead wearing that sort of just person hat and doing basically story gathering. And so my background, as you heard, um, contains a lot of international law, um, the tribunal with the UN, um, the extra judicial, extra judicial executions mandate with the UN Special Rapporteur, my time in West Africa, um, and all of that was part of human rights work. Um, and at the basis of human rights documentation work is really this idea of stories and story finding and storytelling. Um, so I did a lot of interviews for stories when I was in West Africa with people who had um, witnessed really excruciatingly violent executions. Um, in my work in the US, it's usually less sort of ostensibly explicitly violent. Um, but still about suffering. And so I spent a year going around the country as part of my fellowship with Human Rights Watch and ACLU National talking to people who were a part of the criminal justice system that prosecuted uh, drugs and drug use and drug possession and sometimes drug addiction. Um, and so I talked to 366 people. Um, one of my colleagues suggested I could make one of those like page a day calendars and have one depressing quote for every day of the year. It's one of the stupid jokes you're supposed to laugh at. Um, and so I did 366 interviews. 150 of those people had been prosecuted for their own personal drug use. The rest were family members, brothers, sisters, children, mother, fathers, um, prosecutors themselves, defense attorneys, cops, sheriffs. I learned a lot from talking to law enforcement, judges, and how they saw the issue. Um, and basically, the point of this report and the stories that I gathered that are a part of it um, is to talk about what, what a law enforcement approach to drug use means for people, right? And so like, what, what are the stories? How do we look at this issue, not necessarily only as policymakers or only as lawyers trying to challenge something, but how do we hear the voices of the people who are impacted? Um, so this report, which was held up, contains about 60 profiles of people whose lives were really devastated by the law enforcement approach to drugs. Um, and so obviously, let's talk about marijuana, um, and I want to do that first. But I also then want to spend some time talking about what we can learn from marijuana for those 60 other people who are in the report. Um, I want to then thirdly talk this afternoon about sort of what I've learned through this whole process. Um, and because that's a lot of talking, I want to leave some time at the end to hear from you all. So I want to begin with a story. Um, it's a story about marijuana, it's a story about drug policy, it's a story about incarceration. Um, and I have this, I really this is like my goodie bag up here. Um, I don't have that many more tricks to pull out. But this is in my office. It was in my last office, it's in my current office in Newark now. Um, and I don't know if you all in the back have better glasses than I do, um, but it's a drawing of like Carnival of Mardi Gras time in New Orleans. And it was drawn by a man um, at the time in prison, now at home, um, who was serving 17 years in New Orleans um, for having half an ounce of pot. Not for selling it, not for distributing it, not for crossing borders with it, but just for possessing it for him and his friends to smoke that evening. Um, and so I don't know how many of you smoke, but it's still illegal. Um, but it's 
half an ounce is not a whole lot of pot, right? Like you can, depending on how strong it is, you can roll like maybe eight joints. Um, he was in a car with two other people though, so it's not, it's not a whole lot of pot. I see people looking at each other. Maybe my calculations are bad, but I don't think it's a lot of joints, right? Um, and so they were driving, and this story is a story that I heard, blocking the mics, this story is a story that I heard a lot, um, and it didn't necessarily have to be one about pot, right? So they're driving, um, and a cop pulls them over for a broken taillight or some other BS reason. Um, and Corey is this man's name, um, is in the car with his two friends. The woman in the passenger seat is eight months pregnant, and he's like, well, I don't want you to go to prison. In Louisiana, marijuana possession is a felony. Um, the other guy is the father of the baby-to-be, and he doesn't want him to go to prison, so Corey takes the Ziploc bag and puts it in his waistband. Um, and the cops pull up, and they smell the odor of marijuana, which under the law gives them probable cause to search the car. Um, and they search the car, and they don't find anything, but somehow they manage to search the people, too, and they find the pot in Corey's waistband. Um, and one of the, the patterns you see is basically in the US criminal justice system, it's way too costly to go to trial, right? Costly not just in terms of money, but in terms of risk. Um, and so Corey had two prior convictions. They were both for drugs. It was hydrocodone possession and LSD possession when he was 18 and 21, he's 25 at the time of the arrest. Um, and he had gotten probation both times. So like never serious time behind bars, never serious crimes. But because he was a third time offender under Louisiana law, he was facing 13 and a third years to 40 years in prison. Um, and because he was a third, he didn't get good time credit. So he was doing all of that time day for every single day. And the prosecutors offered him 10 years. Like, if you gave me the option to do 10 years or potentially 40, I don't know what I would do if I was guilty or if I was innocent, right? And part of what we see as advocates and lawyers is that that kind of impossible deal means that people often don't exercise their right to go to trial. But Corey did, and he's like, 5% of the people in the US who actually exercise their right to go to trial, right? It's like 95% of people plead. So he goes to trial and he gets 20 years for half an ounce of pot. Um, and the thing is down there, the jury isn't allowed to hear what he's facing for time. They just think, why are you here over this pot that was clearly in your waistband, right? So they convict him and the judge decides that 20 years is the right sentence. So he goes to prison. His girlfriend at the time is also eight months pregnant, not the girl in the front of the car though. Um, she has their baby when he's inside. The first time he holds her is at Angola prison. Have any of you heard of Angola? It's like one of the worst prisons in the United States. It's really awful. Um, so he's at Angola for some reason, this horrible prison where a ton of people on death row have been, um, holding his little baby for the very first time on a half an ounce of pot. Um, and I end up meeting him as he's serving his sentence and at one point in some prison visit, he's an amazing artist and so his, um, his mother is raising his daughter, Charlie, and he had, um, mom had shown me like some of the cards, the birthday and Christmas cards that he had drawn for Charlie when he was in prison. Um, and so I asked him to draw me something New Orleans-y and uh, one day at work, this arrived. So he had drawn it and sent it to his mom and his mom had gotten it framed and surprised me at work. Um, we don't have a ton of time, so I won't tell you the whole story, but basically uh, the ACLU and Human Rights Watch got involved and he ended up getting the chance to be resentenced. Um, and we convinced the prosecutor to remove that habitual offender enhancement um, so that at the end of the day, he only had to do five years and he had already served five years. So he ended up going home uh, three days before Father's Day last year. Um, and his daughter was five years old, right? Like he had been in prison for five years already on a Ziploc baggie of pot. Um, she had never like done anything with him outside, right? When she was little, they used to visit him in prison um, and she thought it was where he worked. That was the story that her grandparents had told her. Um, but now, like, he gets to go to her dance class with her. He gets to take her to the zoo. They just, everything is still their first, right? So they just had their first Easter. They had their first Christmas. She turned, 
she turned six actually in January. They just had, you know, the first birthday together. Um, so I tell this story for several reasons. Um, one of them is that even though New Jersey is thinking about legalization, it is still the fact that marijuana is criminalized here and in most states. In 42 of the 50 states in the US, it can be prosecuted as a felony. And in many of them, you're looking at serious prison time, which is extraordinary, I think, given what we all know about marijuana. Whether or not you think it's a great idea to go smoke, the facts are that marijuana is less addictive than caffeine, and I can speak to the to the caffeine addiction, but it's not that serious, right? Like, I can still do my job. It's less addictive than caffeine. It's a painkiller. We know, you know, medical marijuana in so many states that haven't legalized recreational use has been hugely successful. With the opiate epidemic right now, we know we need alternatives to addictive painkillers. Um, so the crazy thing is, despite all that, it can still be prosecuted as a felony in 42 states. The other reason I tell this story um, is because I really encourage us all, as we're talking about marijuana legalization, to think about other drugs. Um, and not necessarily legalization or even decriminalization, though my organization supports that, um, but to think about how wrong-headed the war on drugs more broadly is, right? And it's been 45 years since the war on drugs was declared, and I don't think any of us can pretend that it was a success, success right? I don't think anyone can pretend that addiction is not on the forefront of people's minds as it wasn't 45 years ago. I don't think anyone can pretend that we've you know, incarcerated our way out of a drug problem. And so I encourage us all to think about sort of what the war on drugs has meant beyond marijuana also. And then finally, though I don't think we'll have time to talk about it right now, maybe we can get to it in the q and I, I think Corey and Charlie, his daughter's story, tells us that we have to think about our criminal justice system writ large, um, right? And in the United States, we incarcerate 2.3 million people, um, which is more by far than any other country. Um, in New Jersey alone, there are about 36,000 people behind bars. Um, and, and what are we doing with those lives? And not just those lives of the people behind bars, but those lives of the people who are proverbially there also, right? The, the mother, the daughter, um, the girl who grows up without her dad and goes to her dance classes in the zoo without him. Um, so I, I have that drawing in my office because I think it's really important to remember the Corys and the Charlies of the world. So let's talk about pot a little bit. Um, as I said, in, you know, in New Jersey, we're looking at alternatives. We're looking at legalization. Um, and the ACLU, along with partners in a coalition called NJUMR, New Jersey United for Marijuana Reform, um, is really pushing a, uh, a bill package that would include racial and social justice. Um, but it, zooming out, again, the truth is, is that in most states, it's still criminalized. And it's still criminalized as part of the broader drug use prohibition. Um, and so in the year I wrote that report, I crunched a lot of numbers um, with a lot of help from statisticians. And what we found is that in 2015, according to the FBI's own statistics, there were more than 1.25 million arrests for drug possession alone around the country by state law enforcement. So that's at the state level. There are laws criminalizing the personal use and possession of drugs. And police made more arrests for those crimes than for any single crime in the US. Right? So it's, it's the number one most arrested offense. And what's particularly shocking, I think, is that half of those were for marijuana. And so I think we, you know, we sit here in New Jersey and we talk about legalization. And I'm really fired up about what that could mean for racial and social justice. And we want the bill to be perfect. But, but like zooming out, half of the arrests for drug possession in this country are still for marijuana. And that's extraordinary. What that also means by way of comparison is that that year in 2015, there were more arrests for marijuana possession, again, not sales, straight up possession, than for all violent crimes combined. So, like, so stick that up here for a second. Police in this country made more arrests for marijuana possession than for all violent crimes. And I think, and this can be a longer conversation in the Q&A also, I think we have to rethink how we talk about violent crimes if we want to be serious about reforming our prison system and decarceration. 
Um, but putting that aside for a moment, I don't think any of us, or frankly most police officers, think that the job of law enforcement should be to get pot off the streets, first and foremost, right? I think it's like to keep communities safe, it's for public safety. And so the fact that marijuana arrests outnumbered violent crime arrests is kind of crazy to me. Um, so that's sort of a sense of the big picture. Um, in New Jersey, each year, police are making about 25,000 arrests for marijuana possession. Um, and so that's a lot of arrests. And someone asked me at lunch whether there was a moratorium, and I said, I don't think so. And I double checked with our policy council, and even though we're talking about legalization in this state, there's no moratorium on arrests. And you know, we're hoping that in practice they're sort of deprioritized, but until the law is changed, the truth is that people are still being arrested and in extraordinary numbers. I'll also say the terminology is a little complicated, right, because people talk about legalization and people talk about decriminalization and people talk about criminalization. Right now we're in a criminalization state, right? We, we criminalize, there are criminal penalties attached to having marijuana. A lot of states have decriminalized and what that means is taking away the criminal sanction but still not allowing for like tax and regulate or retail sale and still allowing for administrative fines. Um, and so to the extent you're a part of this conversation, I would encourage you to, to listen for that distinction because in states that have decriminalized, literally like New York, for example, which has decriminalized de facto, there are literally a, more than 100,000 arrests per year still for marijuana. And that's because either it's still criminalized in public view. So what do cops in New York, where I live, do? They say like, okay, empty your pockets, right? And then you empty your pockets and you have pot and then it's in public view and then it's still criminal, which seems a little unfair. Or they, imp sorry, to keep whatever's in your pocket in your pocket. Um, or, or, they, or they impose administrative fines, right? Like a, like a traffic ticket. But then when you don't pay your fine, you can still be arrested. So for states that have done that, like Ohio, you're, they're still making tens of thousands of arrests. Um, so it's not enough simply to decriminalize. The other thing is if you legalize, there is a whole lot of money in it, right? So NJUMAR, our coalition has estimated that taxing and regulating marijuana like we do alcohol would produce over 300,000, I can't say big numbers because I've never seen that kind of money, $300 million in tax revenue annually for New Jersey. And that's a whole lot of money, right? So what do we want, right? Legalization would mean people are not going to jail anymore, right? And right now under the current system, you can spend up to six months in jail if you're caught with about a cigarette worth of marijuana. Um, under the current system, you can lose your job if you're arrested for marijuana. Um, you can have your driver's license suspended if you're arrested for marijuana. Um, you can face up to $1,225 in fines and fees. Um, if you're an immigrant, you can lose your immigration status. You can be potentially deported, especially under the current federal immigration landscape um, if you're arrested with marijuana. Um, if you live in public housing, you can be evicted if you're arrested with just a cigarette worth of marijuana. Um, and you also obviously expose to yourself to all kinds of private discrimination, right? When I apply to rent the studio that I live in, they do a criminal background check, right? And so there are a lot of landlords, there are a lot of employers, the ACLU doesn't background check, but there are a lot of employers who background check. And that arrest record and conviction, if it turns into a conviction, it can stay on your record for up to three years, even before you're allowed to try to get it expunged here in New Jersey. So there are a lot of really negative, human costly consequences that come with an arrest. Um, the other thing that I want to be sure to mention is that although I would push back at the idea that our jails and prisons are just full of marijuana smokers, right, or even drug offenses more generally, the possession of marijuana and arrest thereof definitely fuel the cycle, right? And so it encourages certain types of law enforcement practices, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, it leads to an arrest and conviction record, which can be taken into account when you come before a judge for something else. And it like fuels this cycle of incarceration. Um, and so it's still a part of our mass incarceration problem more generally. Um, it's also subject to abuse, right? So, so I talked about Corey and being pulled over with the broken taillight. 
if police, where, where marijuana is criminalized, if police smell the odor of marijuana, it gives them under the law what's called probable cause to search. And so if they pull a car over and smell marijuana, they can legally search anywhere that marijuana could be found. Um, that can be in the trunk. That can be in the glove compartment, right? That can be anywhere that you could put a joint, which is a lot of places in a car. And the thing is they can then arrest for anything they find, even if they never find marijuana, right? And so I'm not gonna stand here and say, cops lie. I'm not going to stand here and say cops don't lie either. Right? All I'm saying is the law empowers cops to, if they smell marijuana, do whatever they want in your car, basically. Right? And so that fuels arrest for tons of other things. Um, and again, is part of this pretextual stop and racial profiling that we've seen, for example, on the New Jersey Turnpike and empowers officers um, to police certain kinds of behavior. What we also know about pretextual policing is that it's racially biased, right? And I don't need to tell any of you that racial profiling is a real thing. Um, in New Jersey, a black person is about three times more likely to be arrested for marijuana than a white person, even though we know across the country and in this state that black and white people use marijuana and in fact use all kinds of drugs at approximately equivalent rates. Um, so black people don't use pot or smoke pot three times more than white people, but they're still arrested for it three times more. That's racial discrimination. We also know that our jails and prisons are disproportionately full of people of color, right? And not because people of color are committing more crimes. Um, in New Jersey, I, actually, how many of you know that New Jersey is the worst offender when it comes to racial disparities? Raise them high and proud. What's that phrase? I don't know. High and proud, I just made that up. Um, so New Jersey incarcerates black people at a rate 12.2 times higher than white people. 12.2, right? That makes us the single worst offender in black and white racial disparities in the entire country. It's more than twice the national average of the black to white racial disparity, which is already problematic, right? So we have a massive racial justice problem here in this state. Um, in the way law enforcement is conducted and the way our prisons and jails are filled. Um, and so I suggest that marijuana legalization can begin to chip away at that. Um, and so I asked a little while ago, what do we want? I'm now gonna tell you what we want. We wanna legalize, right? We wanna tax and regulate. We want to set up retail shops essentially and also allow for home grow. Um, and we wanna do that with a racial and social justice bent. Um, and we want to do that because, one, criminalizing marijuana has led to all these harms that I talked about, right? And by legalizing it will help fix a broken criminal justice system that's based upon racially unjust arrests. Um, we also think it'll help free up law enforcement for other things. So it's actually enhancing public safety. And I'd love to talk to you all about that more um, in the question and answer session, because I think a lot of people who are still scared of marijuana are afraid from the perspective of public safety. Um, and there are also, and there are in fact tons of studies to suggest that public safety would actually be served by legalization. Um, legalization, as opposed to criminalization and even decriminalization, would also create jobs. So it would create jobs in construction, in agriculture, in retail, um, in product innovation, um, and other industries that could boost our state and our local economies. Um, as I mentioned, it would generate over $300 million in tax revenue, which could be reinvested in the communities hardest hit by the war on marijuana and the war on drugs. Um, and it would also, I think, make New Jersey a real leader in social and racial justice if we do legalization the right way. Um, so what does the right way mean? And I think there are really like four pillars or core points um, that any marijuana legalization bill would have to include for it to be really racially just. Um, and the first of those is automatic expungement, right? So Dr. Kearney sort of asked the rhetorical question, what happens to all the people who have already been convicted? Um, and what we want a marijuana legalization bill to do 
is to automatically expunge all those records, right? Because we know that the, the indignity of an arrest, right, being thrown up against the wall, having your pockets searched, having your car searched is, is huge, right? Going to, now we have bail reforms, so you're not gonna stay in jail that long, but if you go to jail, that's horrible, right? The fines and fees that I talked about are enormous. The stigma that comes with a conviction is incredible. Um, but it's, it's all those things at the front end, and then it's your whole life of all the consequences of a collateral, of, of a conviction, all the collateral consequences of the conviction, right? And so in our work in general at the ACLU, we talk a lot about um, all the barriers to employment, to housing, to social and civic engagement that come with a criminal record. Um, and we think if this state is gonna say marijuana should be legal, we should fix all the lives we made harder by slapping a conviction for marijuana on records. So that's what automatic expungement means. Um, it's also really important that we, we see how black and brown communities are kept out of local, state, and national businesses, right? And so it's really important that if we're gonna create businesses around marijuana, we not keep black people out of it, right? Like we don't want this to be a white run industry, which is the way most of our industries in this country are run. Um, and so that means two things. That means reinvesting tax revenue into communities hardest hit, right? In terms of education, in terms of drug treatment programs, um, in terms of adult training. But it also means, and this is the third pillar, lowering the access to, uh, lowering barriers to accessing the market. Right, so in states that have legalized and set up retail systems, um, there's usually some sort of licensing fee, right? You have to do something just like in any other industry to be a part of it. Um, and so it's really important that those licensing fees be low so that we don't just make it elitist. Um, it's really important that those um, sort of requirements to be a part of the industry don't contain bars if you have a criminal conviction, right? Because we know that it's not because black and brown people use marijuana or other drugs at higher rates, but nevertheless, they're stamped with these convictions disproportionately, right? So to keep them out because they have a conviction would be highly problematic and racially unjust. And so in all our work around this, we're calling for lowering the barriers to entry, ensuring licensing fees aren't prohibitarily high, um, ensuring that there aren't bars because of conviction, et cetera. And the fourth thing, um, which I think is really important and not a lot of states have done, is we think it's really important that you have home grow. Um, who knows what home grow is? I didn't before I started talking the policy talk. Um, but it basically means people need to be able to grow plants at home. Um, because sometimes, for some people who use marijuana, they may be using because of medical reasons, right? There may be mobility issues. There are all kinds of reasons that it's hard to get to a retail store. Um, and so we think as a matter of economics, um, it's really important that we don't keep people who don't have access to retail from using something that we're saying um, is legal. Um, this wouldn't mean you could have an entire farm of marijuana plants. I think what we're suggesting usually looks something like three flowering plants at any time. Um, so it's not a lot, but it's something that's really important to the coalition work. Um, and I like using the analogy to tomatoes, even though it's a little false because I really don't know how to grow anything. Like I kill a cactus, um, but thanks for laughing. Um, but if I wanted to grow tomatoes, right, it's legal. Um, I couldn't grow a whole farm of tomatoes and sell it without you know, doing it through a farmer's market or, like, or certain kinds of FDA stuff. Um, but if I wanted to grow tomatoes for myself, I could grow a tomato plant. And it's sort of the same idea with marijuana. Um, so that home grow piece is really important. Um, and so I'd love to talk about that more, but I also am looking at my watch. Um, so I'm gonna put a little pin in, in what we're looking for out of these bills and suggest that maybe some of you um, can ask questions about it or express concerns about it in the question and answer period. I wanna shift now um, briefly to some more stories and some more people that I met, because I think, as I said at the beginning, um, it's really those people and those human stories that are inspiring the work I do. Um, so I wanna tell you another story about, um, about an arrest, because I think one of the things we talk about a lot in marijuana legalization conversations is how costly just an arrest can be, right? And, and it's not necessarily the 20 years behind bars that Corey was facing 
that is harmful. Um, it's also just the experience of arrest. Um, so in the parish over from New Orleans, from Orleans Parish, is a parish called Jefferson Parish. Um, and I met a man who didn't want to use his real name because he was already exposed to so much, so much stigma, um, but he liked the name Darius. So I call him Darius Mitchell. Um, and Darius has a little boy um, who I met um, and who had a really big burger. Um, and he uh, is not married to Darius's mom, not um, partners with mom, but they co-parent really well together. Um, so Darius was going to pick his then six-year-old son up from his mother's house at like 10 or 11 p.m., kind of late, um, but not criminally late, right? Um, and is on the road and is driving um, down the road in Jefferson Parish and is pulled over by the cops. And they don't even tell him why they pulled him over, but they pull him over, rolls down the window. I don't know why I just did that. He rolls down the window, right? I don't know the last time I was actually in a car where you roll down the window, but he pushes the button, I presume, to roll down the window um, with the six-year-old asleep in the back. And the cop starts yelling at him. And he says, where are the pounds? Where are the pounds? And Darius is like, I don't know what you're talking about. What pounds? It's like, I smell marijuana. Where are the pounds? The little boy in the back wakes up and starts crying. Um, and the officer makes Darius get out of the car. Um, he makes the little boy get out of the car. Um, and they're standing in the cold at now like almost midnight. And the officer is calling for backup. Darius is a black man, I should have said, but you all can probably guess that. Um, so he, he's insisting that he smells marijuana, right? And this is how that probable cause based on the odor of marijuana becomes really problematic because it empowers this police officer and the two backup cops who come to search everywhere in that car where marijuana could be found. And they open up um, the glove compartment and they don't find pot. They never find pot. There was never any pot to find. Um, but they do find a like, pill bottle of hydrocodone. Um, and it has a prescription on it, like it has a label, and it is made out to Darius's son's mom. Um, and she had gone to the ER, she had been prescribed, like I'm not making this up, because he was eventually acquitted, right? Like he goes, he takes her to the ER, she gets prescribed hydrocodone, she's afraid of all these stories she's heard about addiction to painkillers, so she doesn't take it, but she fills the prescription and leaves it in the glove compartment and the cops find the hydrocodone. They end up charging Darius, even though he's explaining all this, they end up charging him with felony possession of hydrocodone, which would be his first offense. He's never been, I don't know how, as a black man in Louisiana, he managed never to be arrested before, but he's never been arrested before and he's facing zero to five years on this felony. And he ends up um, literally emptying the bank account he hires a private attorney. His son is totally traumatized by this experience of police essentially yanking him and his dad out of the car and screaming at them and calling his dad a drug dealer. Um, kid starts waking up in the middle of the night with nightmares. Darius spends all his money. He literally, like, what's the word? Um, when you're renting furniture, right? Like he has to return his furniture because he can't make the payments on the furniture from Coles or wherever he has it on a plan from. Um, he loses his cable service, his lights go out at one point, right? Like he spends all his money on this private attorney, paying bond to get out, and then on this private attorney to fight this case. Um, and eventually, the doctor in the ER like has given an affidavit to say the hydrocodone belonged to the woman. The jury eventually acquits him, which is really rare, right? And he gets an acquittal. And so it's like, great, no harm, no foul. Uh, but I tell this story because I met Darius a year plus after all this happened. Um, his lights were back on, but his cable wasn't back on, right? He still didn't have the sofa anymore. He still had the arrest conviction, I'm sorry, the arrest record on his record. So when you searched his name as a potential employer, you could still see that he was arrested, right? And he was still out the cash, and he had all these scars of the process of being presumed guilty when he was really innocent, right? Which is the reverse of what our criminal justice system is supposed to do. Um, his son was still waking up with nightmares. And so I tell that story because I think, you know, we have this system that's supposed to, and I'm, I'm a lawyer, right? Like I'm part of the, the justice system in some way. And I think our adversarial system is set up in a way that's meant to like ferret out the truth, 
right? And it, it did in Darius's case. Like he was acquitted, that's justice. That's accountability or the lack thereof because there was none to have, right? But he was still burdened with all of this. And at the end of it, he wasn't made whole, right? He, he wasn't back in the position he was when he picked his son up from son's mom's house, right? He had still suffered all this indignity, all this trauma, had a son who now thought a certain thing of the cops. And, and it didn't get all better just because he was acquitted. And so I just encourage you as you're going to bed tonight or whenever, as you're thinking about this tomorrow, to sort of think about all the harm we do in a system that criminalizes personal drug use, whether it be marijuana or otherwise, and how even when it's not Corey's 20 years in prison, um, even when it's not five years in prison, even when it's not a conviction, like how much that funneling of people into a system of guilt, um, how much harm that does, because I think that's really significant. Um, I'm looking at my watch because I have so many stories I want to tell you. Um, but zooming out for a second, I think one thing that was really shocking to me when I was doing my research um, and the data um, analysis is in how many states low-level offenses are prosecuted, right? So like tiny, tiny amounts of drugs are prosecuted really harshly. Um, and I raise that because I'm trying to make the linkages from marijuana to other drugs. And I think part of, for most of us who think we need to legalize, part of what feels so crazy about arresting and prosecuting for marijuana is this idea of like the scales of justice, right? Like it just feels disproportionate. It feels like something's out of balance. Um, and personally, I think criminalizing any kind of personal drug use is disproportionate, but that's especially so when we're dealing with these tiny amounts. So in Texas, I ended up spending a lot of time in Texas, um, and Texas keeps really good data. Um, and the way their statutory code is written, you can tell how the weight of the drugs that someone had based on how they were prosecuted, like what offense they were prosecuted with. Um, and so the data that we crunched, the numbers we crunched in Texas allowed us to see who was prosecuted for how much drugs, basically. And what we found was a lot of people go to prison in Texas. Surprise, surprise, right? We know they incarcerate a lot of people. A lot of go to, people go to prison in Texas for drug possession. And 80% of those people who go to prison for drug possession had under a gram, right? So, so like a sugar packet is three grams, right? A paper clip is like a gram. Um, and different drugs weigh different things. So it's a little apples and or to oranges. But depending, you know, meth, like you can do, you can get higher off of less, right? Um, than different kinds of Coke. Um, I had to learn a lot about drugs and I still don't talk about them very well. I had a lot of guys like trying to explain a police report to me and being like, whoa, wait, let me explain to you how a crack pipe works. Um, you're supposed to laugh again. <laughs> um, but like it's not a lot of drugs is what I'm trying to say, right? It's under a gram. And when I started talking to people, so, so point being it's like a few hits of something maybe, um, depending on and if you're, you know, if you use a lot and you have a greater dependence, it's even less. You're not going to get high that much off of a tiny amount. You're definitely not distributing. Right? And I talked to people, and what I realized is it's not like 0.999 grams that people were going to prison for, these 80% of people going to prison. What it was was minuscule amount, like fractional amounts. It's been a really long time since I've been in math class, but like even I know these fractions are really small. So I met one person who was serving 15 years for having 0.007 grams. Right? Like, I don't even know what that is. That's seven one thousandths of a gram of meth, right? The jury had sentenced him to 15 years. That's in Danbury, Texas, on that. Um, I heard it is totally insane. I don't know who just said that. It's totally insane. I um, talked to one, I found one case where someone, let's see if I can get this right, was prosecuted as a, as a felony with 0 0.00052 grams, where the rate of error at the lab was 0 0.0038. So I think that math is, it could have been as little as 0 0.0014. I think that's the math, right? Um, 
That's crazy, right? And the crazy thing is that residue, like you don't pull that out of your, I'm gonna go to your pocket again. You can't pull 0.0014 grams of, that was Coke, out of your pocket, right? Like it, that's a, like there's some dust in my hair that's bigger than that, right? So what it means is that these people were being arrested with paraphernalia, right? There was a needle in one case. There was a crack pipe in another case, and that's how I came to understand the anatomy of crack pipes. There was, you know, a syringe top in another case. Um, there was a baggie in another case, right? And, and actually, in one case, they weighed the baggie also and then had to reweigh it and found it was only trace amounts. But what's crazy is all of these people in Texas who had these tiny residue amounts could have been prosecuted for paraphernalia, and that's a misdemeanor in Texas. But instead, they were prosecuted on felony drug charges and were facing literally years in prison because of it. Um, tell you one quick story, and I'll wrap up soon-ish. Um, one quick story of a woman I call Nicole, um, and the report starts with her. Um, and I met Nicole in Harris County Jail right before her 30th birthday, um, and she was a mom. She had two kids, um, and the baby, her baby I called Rose, because um, that's, even though I made a joke about my bratty sister at the beginning, um, I'm really, really close to her, and that's her middle name. So I decided to call the baby Rose, because when you use pseudonyms, you can do things like that. Um, and Nicole was charged with two felonies for a, um, two residue felonies for heroin in a baggie and for cocaine in a straw. I don't think they could weigh the coke that was in the straw, and the heroin ended up being 0.01 grams of heroin when they weighed, when they weighed that. Um, and it was her first arrest. Um, it was her first felony charge. She couldn't make her bail, so she was literally sitting in a jail for a period of months trying to come up with some sort of plea um, arrangement with the prosecutor. And meanwhile, she acknowledged she was really lucky. Um, you know, she had a partner at home who was taking care of the kids. Um, but her little baby was really little when she, uh, when she was arrested. And so the baby ended up like learning to sit up by herself when Nicole wasn't at home. Um, her husband brought the baby to the jail, but there's only, you don't have contact visits in most jails, so they were looking at each other through a glass, and you can't like hear each other at most jails, so they were talking to each other through a phone, and the baby like, couldn't figure out how to hold the phone, because she's a baby who had just learned to sit up. So the mom is like trying to tell her baby, good job, honey, I'm so proud of you, you're sitting up, and the baby like couldn't figure out how to use a phone or why she couldn't touch her mother. And, and Nicole is sitting there, on residue, right? For something that, like, if she had a drug problem, she should have, like, treatment and she should, like, you know, be able to get classes and talk to someone, right? And not be sitting facing two felony charges. Um, she ended up resolving it because I followed up with her. She ended up resolving it. Um, they dropped the straw charge and they let her plead to a felony conviction on the heroin, the 0 0.01 grams of heroin in the baggie. And she got probation, which was good. Um, but let me explain to you what that meant for her, right? Because now she had a felony conviction. She was getting her MBA, um, but she was getting student loans. So now she had a felony, and you don't qualify for student loans, for federal FAFSA student loans, if you have a felony drug conviction. So she lost her student aid. She had to stop going to school. Um, when she was pregnant, she was relying on food stamps. Um, and in, each state does it a little differently, but in Texas, there's a year think it's a year, um, mandatory bar um, from food stamp receipt if you have a felony drug conviction like Nicole did. So she lost the food stamps that she was relying on to feed her two little kids. Um, they were renting an apartment um, and the lease was coming up and they wanted to move and she couldn't get on the lease of the new place because no one wants to rent to someone who has a felony conviction. Um, there was one more thing. Oh, her job, right? Like she had a job. She, she still, I believe, had the job when she got out because she was only in for a matter of a couple months and they worked with her. But she was scared that if she ever wanted to change jobs, she was going to be discriminated against and not pass a background check, right? Because she had a felony drug conviction. And she literally said to me at one point, it's not, this was before she had it resolved. So she was talking about prison time. And she said, it's not just the prison time test. It's my whole life. This punishment will be for the rest of my life. 
And so the reason I tell this story, and I hope you can follow my threads here, I think I'm a little all over the place, but the reason I tell this story is like the reason I tell Darius' story, or like the reason I tell Corey's story, even though he's at home with his daughter now. It's that the impact of a criminal justice system that looks at drug use, that looks at personal drug use as possess and possession as a criminal offense, punishable by jail time and a criminal record, a system that does that is basically criminalizing human beings, right? And not just the human being who uses, but that person's children too, that person's partners too, that person's opportunity to participate in economic and social life because that stigma that comes with the conviction is so extraordinary. Um, and so as we talk about marijuana legalization and we talk about you know, how to do that in a racially and socially just way, I think it's important that we make sure, you know, home grow is in there and like all these specific, specific paragraphs are in there. But I think it's also important, maybe not as legislators yet, but certainly as activists and advocates and, and citizens and residents. And, you know, I, I mean that non-immigration wise, but just as people in this country, right, that we think about why we're looking at drugs in this way, like why it's a matter of law enforcement and not public health. Um, and in all these stories that I gathered over that year, I really came to feel that it's a massive tra tragedy and travesty um, to treat people as criminals for their drug use. Um, so I'm looking at my watch and I want to save time for questions. So I, I think I'll wrap up there um, and just say that, you know, I know most of you are students and most of you are undergraduate students and that's wonderful. Um, I was saying to some people at lunch that I started off as a physics major and ended up as a French major and now I'm a lawyer. So I think like the time that you spend in school is really about finding yourself and your voice and your convictions, not in the criminal justice sense, right, but in like your principles. Um, and it matters less about your course of study and more about you know, your introspection and the conversations you have with your professors and your fellow classmates. Um, and I just encourage you all sort of as you think about how to use your voice, wherever that may be, whether that's in politics or business or social justice, um, that you think about all those stories, right? And your own stories too. Um, and I feel as a lawyer, you know, even though I get mired in the the physics of the law, quite literally, oftentimes, um, for me and for my colleagues at the ACLU, it's really about those stories at the end of the day. Um, and all the work we're trying to do around marijuana legalization is so that we can prevent some of those bad stories from happening again and remedy some of those sad stories for those people who are carrying the cost of a conviction with them even to this day. Um, so I thank you for laughing at my bad jokes um, and for being such an engaged audience. And I would love to, um, to answer questions about marijuana, about drug policy, um, about buttons, about, I'm, you know, it wasn't that long ago that I was in school. So to the extent you want to talk about social justice careers and what it means to um, make decisions post-graduation, um, I'm game for any of it. So thank you. Say because this uh, because we're uh, recording this session, the way we want to do questions is we want to literally pass the mic. So if anybody has a question, we want to get you the microphone so you can ask it uh, through the microphone. So any question or comment? Thank you. This is kind of cool. With a criminal justice system that makes it easier for people to plead guilty than to fight your case, how do we as young people try to combat a system that's more about planning, pinning blame and getting a conviction than trying to help its citizens that the law is supposed to protect? What's the course of action for now? Yeah, That's a huge question and a really great one, so thank you for it. Um, so let me reiterate that the vast majority of people in the state system and in the federal system plead guilty. Um, and some of what I was talking about with Corey is what some of us call a trial penalty, right? So you'll be offered the 10 years that Corey was offered, but then if you take your case to trial and lose, you'll often get like the full extent of the law, right? So in Corey's case, 
he, the minutia is he got 20 and then he was resentenced to 17 and then he ended up getting out at five. But he, he basically got a trial penalty of 10 years that first time around for exercising his constitutional right to a jury trial. Um, so, so look, I understand in theory why pleas make sense, right? Like you, if you are actually guilty and put aside for another conversation, all the sort of structural reasons in our society that people are forced into certain kinds of crime, right? Because I, I think like our criminal justice system looks only at the individual and that's missing the broader sociological, political, cultural things at play, especially when we talk about race and in New Jersey. Um, putting that all aside, you know, let's say I am like actually guilty of X offense. It makes sense that I should be able to say, I don't need to take that to trial. I, I waive my constitutional right, and I'm going to save you, the state, all this time submitting your proofs. And so I should get a benefit from that. Like That makes sense in theory. The problem is, in practice, 95% of people do that, not necessarily because they're actually guilty and they don't want to try it at try, right? But because they have to, exactly what you just said, because they're being coerced to, because it is so scary. I'm no gambler. Right. And so if you tell me I pick any crime, literally, if you tell me three years today or go to a jury who's like not actually probably of your peers. Right. Because especially in communities of color, the way we police and slap convictions on people, a lot of people are kept from jury service. Right. Because they have a felony conviction. So you put me in front of a bunch of like white people probably who don't understand what's going on. Um, and they might give me 20 years, I'm gonna choose that three no matter what happened. And so that's the, like, I just wanna flesh out sort of that, I think, a, some, um, understanding that's under your question because it's a right one and that's the injustice. As young people, what do you do about it? Um, become public defenders, become prosecutors, become police officers and become judges, right? Like I, maybe one only, um, <laughs> because otherwise there are all kinds of conflicts. Um, but I mean, I think, I think understand what's going on, right? Like that big picture. Um, and then I think be part of the system. And, and different people have different things to say about that, right? Like I have friends who are in the federal Department of Justice, who some of whom left and some of whom wanted to leave when Trump was elected. And I was like, please stay, right? Because we need people who are gonna be as thoughtful as your question is um, on all sides of the criminal justice and law enforcement space. Um, so I think it's like, if you're fired up about this, consider doing work around it. And that may mean public defender, judge, um, prosecutor, et cetera. It may mean activist or advocate. You know, the, the ACLU doesn't individually represent criminal defendants in their criminal trials. We're civil litigators, so we bring lawsuits about systemic injustice. Um, you know, so get involved. You know, there can be that sort of way of doing it too. Um, I think. You know, if you want to think about being a legislator or calling your lawmakers, I think there are a lot of tweaks to the system that would make that 95% coercion rate a little less appalling. Um, I think we need sentencing reform um, in a really meaningful way, not just around drug offenses, but around all crimes, right? We talk about decarceration. I think we're in this moment um, where it's a bipartisan issue and that's really exciting. Like you have red states, you have Oklahoma, doing really amazing things, um, that's great. Um, we're not gonna decarcerate America. We're not gonna come close to shaving thousands off that 2.3 million incarcerated number unless we tackle sentencing reform, right? And that's harder, that's like less palatable because it's not just the, I use like huge scare quotes here, but it's not just like the drug addicts and the victimless crimes, right? Like we're gonna have to confront violent crime and think about why we're okay with sending people away and locking them up and forgetting the key or throwing away the key essentially, right? Um, so our sentences in this country are grossly long. There isn't in many states a meaningful um, parole review process, right? So like I think on the back end, we need to do a lot also. On the front end, like policing reform and who gets brought in to have to make that decision. Do I take the risk? Do I roll the dice and go to trial? Um, so it's a really big question um, with a lot of answers, none of which is going to be the silver bullet. Um, but I applaud you for, for thinking about it.
Hi. Hey. Um, so, as a, a supporter of legalization, uh, especially with the social justice ramifications, mm -hmm. I'm curious about um, the expungement of people yeah. who are already incarcerated, and once how how many people are incarcerated in in the state even? In the state, we have about thirty six thousand, or call it thirty five thousand, behind bars in jails and prisons for anything, right? So there are not that many people. I actually don't know the number. I'm the litigator, not the policy council. But I don't know <laughs> the exact number of people who are only serving time on marijuana possession. I venture it might be zero, right? Because it's a, you can only face up to six months in jail, right? Like it's a, in New Jersey, luckily, it's a pretty low level offense. Um, the thing is, is it spirals, right? So you can like then have other convictions for other things and the judge looks back at your record. And, um, so it's less about getting people out of jail and prison who are there only for marijuana possession and more about expunging the record, so like literally clean slating their record. But um, now my next yeah, yeah. part of that is once, once these people who are, who have these records and get their records expunged, mm -hmm. um, depending on how many people mm -hmm. um, have their records cleared, is it still going to be difficult for them to find jobs and get back on a path towards regular citizenship um, just by the sheer amount of people that are thrown back into it? Yeah, yeah, for sure, yes. Um, and that's a, that's a really smart question, um, right? And that's part of why I think marijuana legalization is absolutely a critical priority this calendar year with racial and social justice full stop. And then if you let me continue, and we need to do more, um, right? Because most people who are targeted by the current criminal justice system have records for other things also, right? And so only it's funding, like, I don't, I don't know the figures, um, but I venture I guess that only expunging marijuana convictions will only get certain people so far. New Jersey has uh, an expungement statute that's not bad, right? Like you can get first time offenses expunged after a certain period of time. Um, so that, you know, we already do sort of have a model by which we could implement automatic expungements with some systemic tweaks. Um, but, the, but the question that I think you're asking is a broader one, like how do we, account for collateral consequences for people more generally. Um, and that's, that's all about reentry services, right? And that's a whole other separate field of study and of work, um, and it's a really important one. That's a good question. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Hey. Oh, sorry. Hi. I just want to know, are you thinking about the health implication of smoking uh, marijuana when you are trying to pass this law? Um, the health implications, yeah, is that what you said? Yeah, from smoking, because yeah. after all, it's smoking on, 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 a, on, a, on a whole. So are you, yeah. are you are you're just generalizing it, or just legalize some um, uh, marijuana so everyone could smoke? Or yeah. you just want to legalize it for people who will use it? You'd say for some people who have MS, they said drinking it as a tea, it helped them. Sure. Are, you, are you doing yeah. general or do you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you That's a good question. And I know people have class and also Maybe I'm boring, but I just want to say thank you. As those of you who are headed out, um, it's been really wonderful to have you all here. Um, so good question, yes. Um, so we mean all of it in um, you know, its various forms, whether that be oil or you know, a joint or a tea, as you say. Um, smoking, I don't know if you mean like because it's rolled with a nicotine bait, like tobacco or something. Is that what you mean by the health consequences of smoking? Uh, uh, yeah. My, I think, I guess, um, my belief. Or like, or like the tar and the. Yeah, yeah. My, my belief: once you smoke, you at risk for, for certain yes, diseases. Yes, yes, yes. So you, you have yeah. to take on. It for on, sure. Uh, you you got to take into account. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. living in disparity, and I'm legalized to right. smoke marijuana. Yes. The government will have to sit the bill when I get the illness anyway. Right. Right. Are you thinking about that? That part. Yeah. Of so absolutely. You legalize it. Yes, absolutely. I think that's a really good question, um, and it's important also to point out there are different ways of using. Um, I don't think that. So two points. One, just because something's legal doesn't mean people are going to do it, right? So actually, New Jerseyans. I should probably check my notes because I think it's a ridiculous number. I want to say it's like three out of four. Three people out of four in New Jersey say they wouldn't try marijuana even if it were legal, which actually kind of surprised me. Um, yeah, 
That's what the polls say. Um, you know, polls say crazy things. The, the most recent poll is the Stockton one, um, but the Quinnipiac poll puts support at 60%. I just want to do a point of order. Um, so, but the poll says at least that 75% of New Jerseyans have no interest in smoking marijuana and it's not the prohibition that keeps them from, right? Like most people can find a place to smoke it in private if they really want to. So most people probably, if they're interested in smoking, have tried before. Um, so, so I say that for a, a couple of reasons. And one of them is that there's plenty of stuff that people choose not to do, even though they could legally, right? Like, I'm not gonna drink vodka, period. Um, even though it's legal, right? But like, I really don't like, I like whiskey, but like, I'm not gonna, there are plenty of things that I, I probably won't smoke a lot of pot if it's legalized, because I like, don't like having the munchies and like being in control, right? So they're like, just because it's legal doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna see a massive uptick in people who are regularly smoking. Um, the other thing is we don't criminalize cigarette smoking, right? And we know the linkage to lung cancer there. Um, so I think, I think it's like a little bit, and I'm not saying this is what you're saying, Ms. Speaker or Ms. Question Asker, um, but I don't feel comfortable as a civil libertarian to say that anything that could be bad for someone's health must be criminal, right? Like we, I think I made a silly reference at the beginning to, to the lights and I said I was a dancer. And I grew up around a lot of ballerinas, right? And there were a lot of people who were anorexic and bulimic. And like we would never criminalize sticking your finger down your throat, even though it literally has resulted in loss of life, right? But like the, the answer to a public health problem is not necessarily criminalization. It's education, it's support services, it's outreach. I definitely um, support, I definitely support, um, not support, um, taking, I think the criminal system is broken yeah. and yeah. we need to yeah, be yeah. fixed. Yeah. Take, take, you, you, um, take off the, the marijuana of it. I don't sure. think you're supposed to solve. I don't think you're supposed to solve the marijuana crisis with, with, with that. Separate it. The system need to be fixed. What was prison built in America on? Yeah. You yeah, know, we slavery. need to go back there yeah. and fix that system. Yeah. So then you don't you because who are the people who who are smoking? I come from a, from an island that yeah. produces yeah. it. So my yeah. island mm -hmm. produces it. Who yeah. are they? People in, in living in disparity. Right. So you um so you're gonna find a majority of us go um not us. I don't smoke. Yeah, yeah. Going to prison, but. Uh, at the right. same time, I'm not saying generalizing it because sometimes kids would have been smoking the marijuana, but because it's illegal, they're not trying it either. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm against smoking overall. I'm I, against smoking tobacco, anything at all, because more people die in America today from smoking cigarette exactly. that is illegal right, right at the library door there than what will die from smoking marijuana. Right. So I'm against smoking under, uh, under broad. Yeah, yeah, I think that's totally valid. Um, I would just also say, because I think the kids piece is important, um, when we talk about legalization, it's only legalizing adult recreational use, right? Um, and it would still be, and I know I can, even with these weak glasses, I can still see the eye roll, right? Like, of course, kids are still gonna get it. But the truth is, kids already get it, right? Like, I first smoked when I was in high school and I was a kid. Um, and so the truth is, criminalizing it only means that you're imposing all the harms of criminalization, and we know prohibition didn't work, right? Whether that be marijuana, or whether that be the 1920s with alcohol. Um, and so I actually think if you wanna talk about kids' safety, the way to keep kids safe is to require them to produce ID to buy something behind a counter, right? Like that's, if kids know how to get pot right now, if you wanna keep them safe, put it behind a counter, right? One more yeah. thing. Yeah. I don't think, oh, sorry, I don't think that ID will, I just wrote a paper on tobacco. Okay. I think the age should raise, it should be banned, because you, let's say then, okay, I'm 21, you put the law out there, you can't smoke, uh, you, you can't buy a cigarette for 20. Yeah. You didn't say I can't smoke. Right. So if That's I have true. a boyfriend right. or a girlfriend right. who, I right. have a boyfriend and a girlfriend, and I said, yeah. go in the store and get it for me. Of course, if, of course. If a cop saw the me smoking, he's not going to put me in right. jail because I'm smoking. The law is only there because right. I have to buy. Right. Right. So ID is still not going to work. Yeah. People still smoke every day. Totally hear you. And I just think, last point on this, that when you, wanna, when you talk about public health, that should be separate and apart from the criminal law, right? Like there are all kinds of public and other social harms we have that I don't think are remedied by criminalization. Um, and so all those things you talk about, I think we can talk about in terms of, you know, 
how parents talk to their kids, in terms of how teachers talk to their students, in terms of the programs and trainings we have available. I have just a quick naive yeah. question. Yeah. Um, do people in prison vote and do felons vote? That is such an important question. Please come take a voting button. Um, it depends on the state. It depends on the state. It depends on the state. So here in New Jersey, you cannot vote while you're still serving your sentence. Um, we want to see not only re-enfranchise, so disenfranchisement is the loss of the vote. Re-enfranchisement re is getting it back again. Um, I want to see no enchisements of any kind, right? Like I just want you to register to vote when you're 17 now, so you can vote when you're 18 and then to hold on to it. Um, so not in New Jersey, you cannot vote when you're in prison. The broader issue in this country though, because I think, not to get political or anything, but I think if, peop if people with felony records or, and or in prison in this country could have voted in the last election, I think we would have a different president. Um, in this country, New Jersey is actually better than most states. So a lot of states say that you can't vote when you're in prison, on probation, on parole, and then for some period of time afterwards. Three, Three states have lifetime disenfranchisement. So we have about six million people, six million voters, yep. I think, yep. in this country, um, who can't, or six million people in this country who cannot vote, right? In three states, you can never vote again after you've been convicted of a felony, which is absurd. Florida is one of those states. If you have friends in Florida, tell them to go to the polls this fall um, because on the ballot is a ballot initiative to give the vote back to people with felony records. And just for a second, I want to be like really meta and say, how crazy would it be if Florida voters voted to restore the vote, right? Like that would be pretty pretty awesome. Because of course the people who want the vote back can't vote because they don't have, right? Like it's a catch 22. Um, so tell your friends in Florida to go vote for that ballot. What are the other two states? The other two states are, man, it's been a while. I think it's, I want to say Kentucky and Iowa. It's in my report. I can check afterwards. But it's been three years since I wrote that. I think it's Kentucky and Iowa. Yeah. Hi. Sorry. Um, I don't want to like, I guess, take shots at anything that you said. Shots. I'm just curious yeah. as to why you compare meth and heroin to marijuana. Yeah. I understand the connection between yeah. marijuana and cigarettes and yep. how that's always compared because yeah. it's similar. But I don't know yeah. if I necessarily agree that somebody who's carrying heroin or meth in yeah. this country, I understand they're an individual, they have lives, yep. but they also were the same individual who chose to do Absolutely. such a thing. Absolutely. So. That's a great question. And also, please take shots if you want to <laughs> ask that in a meaner way. Um, <laughs> no, really. I think that's a really important question. And I think, like, thank you for asking it. And I think as students and people, like, we have to have the difficult conversations, right? Or else we're not engaging and we're not advancing anything or our own understanding. So I compare them not as absolutes, right? Like, or not to say they're the same, but to say there's a comparison, right? So obviously the harms of, and, and people feel differently, but my personal view, not speaking for the ACLU, is that marijuana is pretty harmless, right? Like they've studied toxicity, et cetera. We know THC stays in your blood. Like it, you know, it doesn't stay for that long, or it stays for a long time. It doesn't impact you for that long. It's not super addictive. It kills pain in a safe way, right? Like we know medical, medicinal marijuana has been legalized for a reason. Um, heroin is different. We know its addictive properties are very different. I like ha have someone in my life who died, right? Like I know that those are two very separate drugs. Um, I think like the a lot of drug users and real libertarians say, and I, I think I believe like, if you want to use it, that's like, it's your life, right? Like you're allowed to do what you want with your body as a mere like privacy analysis. Um, I like, if my best friend is using heroin, I'm going to be concerned for my best friend. If my best friend is smoking pot, I'm going to say like, okay, just make sure you like don't miss work. Right. And so I totally acknowledge that those are very different in that sense. And I don't want to pretend or minimize the harms that heroin or any other hard drug have in people's lives, right? Like, and you said meth too, like I, like meth does things to your face and your teeth, right? And I've sat in enough jails with enough people who are there for 
meth possession that I see what it does. And I don't want that for anyone, right? So I, like, let me be totally clear. I don't think the drugs have the same properties. I compare them though, because I think the criminalization of personal drug use, right? Like not selling to kids, not like the drug cartels that bring all the violence with it, um, but like just my personal use, I don't think that should be, a, I don't think that should have criminal sanction precisely because I think the criminal justice in this justice system in this country is so unjust, is so racially biased, um, is so overly harsh, is so lifelong. And so I, I do that like segue or the connection from one to the other because I think some of the things that sound so absurd about pot sound really absurd when you're talking about 0 0.0052 grams of coke, right? or a trace amount of meth because it still feels disproportionate. And so I use that as like an exercise to say, maybe all of this is crazy, but not because I don't think the drug use itself is problematic. But I think like, that's why we need a public health approach. And I think people are realizing that with heroin and, and I'm both glad and a, like a little disturbed that it took a white crisis for America to realize we had a problem, right? Um, I also think that the current administration like Sessions said, and, and Trump say they want to bring back, you know, not only the war on drugs, but in some cases the death penalty for drug dealers, right? So we're sort of like talking out both sides of our mouths. Um, I think it's ass, but excuse my French. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of problems with where we are right now, um, but I think the, the thread can be drawn or the line can be drawn from one to another for certain things, but certain things only. And I really appreciate that you clarify that because, because the harms of serious drug use are totally real. They destroy families and like addiction is awful and overdose death is awful. Um, and I don't mean to belittle any of that as a separate tragedy. Hi guys. I'm a, I'm a drug and alcohol counselor awesome. and I deal with substance abuse and I'm my my dad is a little older than I am he's 63 and then I'm 33 so we're going we're going back and forth about the legalization of weed I personally think that it should be legalized he he doesn't think so because you know if I if I explain the comparison about you know what somebody on heroin or meth does compared to somebody who smokes weed he just like disregards what I'm saying. I had a client who was 32 years old and he was diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was 17, but he never said anything to anybody about it. So he was on drug court and mm -hmm. that was for five years and he continuously smoked weed. He became my client and he continuously went back to jail all the time. And he always got caught for personal use. And I'm saying to myself, all the counseling I'm doing, he continues to go back to jail. It's insane. So I, I said to him when he was released again, because um, they only give you like 30 days. He comes back. So I said, you know, why do you keep smoking? He said, did you read my mental part of my chart? And I said, no. I read it. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia. He said, Ms. Bell, I hear voices. Mm -hmm. He said, so me being, me, he, he goes to work. He has children. He said, me smoking cuts down the voices that I have in my head. He said, you wouldn't understand a conversation going on in your head that has nothing to do with you until it's you. So I asked him, did he ever get, I mean, did he ever get medication for it? He said, yes, he brought the script. The script was so unbalanced. The, the psychiatrist said, that's exactly why it's not working because it's unbalanced. Just say if the numbers were supposed to be 60, 40. It was like 80, 23. Yeah. And it was like not working for him. So he said, he never took it as a kid anymore. So. Me, I'm all for, you know, legalizing it because it's a choice. You know, I don't, it's, it's tough. It's a tough description. I don't want to stay here all day, but it's just tough, yeah. but it's a choice. And as far as the disenfranchisement that it has caused, I'm running for councilwoman hey. in the city that I live in. Everybody needs to be able to see that part of the vote and vote on it. You have to because it's, it's, it's a lot of people don't even know that that part is there because they don't want it to be, you know, voted on. And, and people should be able to vote on it. And um, the election is May 8th, 2018, yeah. the one that I'm running for, the municipal election in the city of Patterson. Yeah. One more thing I wanted to say. Oh, two years after you're off parole and probation, probation you yeah. can vote. Yes. People don't know that. Yes. It was a young lady who just went to jail the other day because she was on parole and she voted. They gave her five years in jail. Yeah. 
yeah. because no her parole officer didn't tell her out of texas that, yeah and that and i think yeah. that that's crazy so now that i'm out here running my generation are the smokers so now that i'm out here running my campaign i'm telling people like you know you've been off of you can vote and they're like oh no i'm not i'm not taking my chance with that the girl just went to jail in texas so now we're going to be so yeah. far behind again because of that so it's, it's tough i had to i'm, I'm not going to keep you guys all day but you know i had to get 816 petition signed and i had to take out 296 because none of the african-american people were registered to vote and when i went back to them and a lot of them said oh no um i was on parole once and i'm not going to vote and i'm like but that was eight years ago they're like no but i'm not going to take my chance so i'm spending my yeah. time going over the process and it's tough but you know thank you guys for listening but yes the people can vote thank you for the work you do Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I think we have to thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to mention, yeah, yeah, sure. He's good. Okay. I just wanted to mention that, you know, obviously a lot of people have left, and at 3.30 the classes start, but uh, Tess has agreed yeah, to stay for a little I've got longer. Time. So if you want to stay, uh, it's fine, and we can continue the conversation. Yeah. I'm Mr. Lasso, I have a question. But you don't have to feel obliged just because you're in the first row. Hey, uh, my question, not a question, but it's more like a discussion I've had with several like peers of mine, mm -hmm. where it's like how prisons and like jails are so like invested in, like people make so much money like wow. in this country from investing in prisons and how like for like, for example, like drugs and this and that, instead of investing money into the jails for and sending mm -hmm. these people to prison, how like they should start like thinking of other like forms, like instead of like, for example, someone with meth or cocaine, send them to like rehabilitation centers mm -hmm. instead of prison mm -hmm. to like actually make them better and improve them and not limit their res like resources when they get out of jail. And cause like most of the time when they leave, they just mm -hmm. end up going back to those same yeah. like habits of theirs. Yeah, um, amen. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, there's the obviously like private prison mm -hmm. and private jail even or private privatization of the care that's given in jail, right? Like we have a lot of private companies providing medical care in local jails, including in this state. Um, you have privatized probation services. You obviously have the private bail bond industry that's currently actually suing the state of New Jersey around our bail reform. Um, there are a ton of private interests. Um, and then there are all kinds of internal local, state, and federal politics also, right? The Federal Bureau, um, Bureau of Justice Assistance um, under the DOJ gives out grants. Um, and it used to be, though they're getting better on some of this, they would condition grants on certain law enforcement metrics, right? Like once upon a time, the number of drug arrests you make would determine how much federal funding you got, right? So that. Like there's a lot of issues with like private prisons. Absolutely. Yes. Because I know, like, in prison, men get free crimes, but mm -hmm. women don't get free um, feminine products at all. Mm -hmm. So that's, like, a lot of issues, too. Like, me and my friend, like, we want to, like, start donating feminine products to, like, these private institutions because they don't that's they great. have the resources. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah, I mean, most prisons I visited, you need to buy, um, you can, like, sometimes get pads, right? But you need to buy tampons off commissary. Yeah. Do you want to um, add to that? It was when I, I, I read since I've been running yeah. how people who are arrested are counted in the census yes. in the city that they live in, yes. but they can't vote. Yeah. Um, the people who are in prison are counted in the yes. census yes. in the areas that they live in, and then yes. in their households, you have to fill out yes. the paper that says, you know, the person is, but they can't vote. Yes. Some, some cities allow you to do a mail-in ballot because mail-in ballots in prison mm -hmm. are for people who can't vote. So mm -hmm. I feel like they're unable to vote because mm -hmm. they can't. They should be able to do a mail-in ballot because they're counted in the census. Yeah. When we get those six million people back, you know, we'll have a better turnout for some of the elections that are coming up because everybody's included in the voting, mm -hmm. you know, because if I can count you in the census as being here, you should be able to vote. Like, it shouldn't be, oh, I can count you, but you really have no rights to vote. Yeah. I don't understand how that makes yeah. sense. So That's like, a huge problem. Yeah, it's um, crazy. And, like, and gerrymandering, right? And so I actually am embarrassed. They don't know how New Jersey does it. But a lot of states will basically have their 
prisons in certain places, right, right where there are not historically communities of we have color. Right in the middle of downtown Patterson. Exactly. And then you get to count all those prisoners for your census for the allocation of the number of representatives you right. get, for example, right. to the U.S. Congress. Right. But those people can't vote in their own elections, That's right? True. So you're literally just like, I mean, I'm going to say it, right? Like, our prison system is what slavery once was, and you're just moving black absolutely. bodies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hi. So, just one last question to close off. Um, yeah. How would you, what's being done to ensure that the benefits of legalization, all the tax revenue yeah. and all that actually gets put back into the communities yeah. that, yeah. that were most hurt by it? So, we're trying to get it written actually into the legislative language, right? And I, I mentioned this earlier, or I made passing reference that one of the reasons that we're excited to do this through the legislature as opposed to the ballot is that you can, one, modify it more easily than having to go back to the ballot, but you can also write in more protections, right? Like your average voter is not going to be able to read a 50-page bill on the ballot question, right? It's going to be like legalize or not. Um, and so part of what's exciting about the legislative opportunity is that we can write all of this in. So what NJUMR.org um, is pushing as part of our social justice and racial justice piece is literally having written in um, programming and like reinvestment in adult classes, in younger education, um, in drug treatment programs, um, ensuring that the communities who have been hit by the war on drugs are able to become part of the people now profiting from it, right? So can access it as small businesses, as retailers, et cetera. Nice. Um, so that's what it's about. Honestly, has, ever, has any piece of legislation ever done everything? No, right? Especially not when it's like, I think you can legislate a w prohibition, prohibitions really easily, right? Like you can say you can't do this, like you can't have solitary confinement or life without parole for certain offenses, right? Like that's good. And it's easier to say don't do something by legislative act. It's harder to say do do something. And what we're trying to do with this bill is say do do all these things. Um, I don't know if that gets at your question. Yeah, so it sort of so does. My, my thing would be, um, so that it's more directed towards like the public school systems in these like low income communities. Um, Since I, that is still a part yeah. of this, like a state responsibility, right? Is that something? Yeah, I know that we're asking for reinvestment, um, and in these particular like programmatic ways, how that affects the public school system, I just don't know. Like I'm not that person. Um, but I think it's a really important one, as you say. And I think again, and that's I hope been clear in what I've, my message is that marijuana legalization is going to happen, I firmly believe, in New okay. Jersey. I mm -hmm. hope it happens in the right ways. Mm -hmm. um, but it's showing us, it's like revealing the, I don't know what you call it, skeletons in the closet, right, of the criminal, and the damage, as you say, of the, of our current criminal justice system, which has left by the wayside public health and education, right? Like pub provision of public good, whether that be health or education or all these things. Um, and so it's a huge thing to tackle. Um, I don't know that marijuana legalization is gonna fix public education, um, but I hope that you know, in making things a little more socially just, it begins to at least suggest ways. Um, I don't know if that gets at it. <laughs> good enough. Yeah, I, I've got time, but you can also like come down and yeah. hang out. It's actually my last question. I'm just curious, but when marijuana is legalized, since your coalition is the one pushing for yeah. legalization, are you guys going to bring to light also the negative effects of marijuana? Because that's something very important to bring out. I understand that there are some positives, yeah. but there are also a lot of studies proving the negative correlation between marijuana and certain um, conditions such as schizophrenia, increased anxiety, um, impaired function, etc. Yeah, so yeah. it's important to yeah. highlight, I feel. So Are you guys doing anything about yeah. that? Yeah, um, so I don't think we're gonna like, so I think the studies go a lot of ways, right? Like most things. Um, I think in general, THC is less toxic than a lot of other chemicals that we allow people to access. Um, but putting that aside, um, I don't, I, we probably won't be saying like, 
we're gonna give you all the information so you can make an informed decision about whether to use, right? Because we're not actually saying go smoke or go use in any other way, right? Like I take no position on whether or not it's a good idea for you to use marijuana. I just don't think you should be arrested for it, right? right? And so that's the, like that's as a social and racial justice issue, that's what we're trying to say. Like you should not be punishing people for this. I think personally that we should decriminalize heroin. And my report on behalf of Human Rights Watch and the ACLU is actually arguing that we should decriminalize all illicit drugs. I am absolutely not saying that everyone should go and shoot up, right? Like absolutely not for the reasons you and I talked about before. But I don't think people who are using either because they're curious or because they have an addiction should go should be arrested and potentially go to jail and prison for it. I think we should have counselors right. like we have in the back of the room to talk to people about what that means. Um, and that needs to happen in a more robust public health space and like social welfare space and not in the criminal justice one.